uh, coming to our session today. Uh, with my colleague Chris here, we're going to be talking to you about some of the trends um, that we've been observing um, over the last uh, year. So just quickly, forgive me, let me talk to you just quickly about what Craft is. Craft is a collaboration of five different companies coming together, all with unique talents um, and approach to market, so that we can work together. Initially, um, the idea was to focus on the KSA market and the mega projects. And what we were doing is we worked together, share our resources, share our knowledge to be able to deliver a much higher uh, product for our customers. And over the last year, we've been talking a lot. And through those conversations, we've been talking about trends and how do we future-proof our F&B concepts in relation and to help our clients, uh, particularly in the hotel market, because very often we're doing things five years before the product comes to market. So we'd like to share some of those ideas for you. Great. I've missed a slide, haven't I? Doesn't matter. So, um, Craft are a company which have come together purely uh, around the idea of, of wanting to be the power of a consortium or working together as a team. And in fact, as we see um, some of the trends, that is one of the trends we'll be talking about it. Um, moving on to um, a kind of a tee up before we start. As Jen mentioned earlier on, this is about hotels. This is about hotel food and beverage. And I'm gonna make a brave statement here by saying Basically that, we've lost the slide, oh, no, we have. Uh, we're going to make a brave statement here by saying that hotels have come a long way. We've come a long way in the last few years. But I have to be honest with you, and I'm an ex-hotelier, I can say this, that we still lag behind in food and beverage when it comes to independent restaurants. Hotels, 15 years ago, particularly in this part of the world, used to be the place that you used to go for that special meal. Unfortunately, that's not the case anymore. The independent restaurants have seemed to have taken centre stage. So now is our chance to really leapfrog and come back and make sure that um, hotels can get um, that, that, kind of, that, that, that feeling back that they are leading hotels. And they should be because they have the resources, they have the backing. Um, this little chart explains a little bit about where hotel restaurants sit. Ideally, you want to be sitting right over there um, and um, on the experience side of this chart, um, and not necessarily up high. There's some great restaurants that sit in that high experience area that do really well. But if you've got your hotel restaurants and you're sitting in that area around kind of the medium price point, but uber experiential, then you're in the right place. If you're in the top area there in the black circle, you really need to think about what we're going to do. So, one of the things we're seeing here is that the luxury customer are no longer looking for luxury. They're looking for experience, and they're looking for things that are approachable and priced right. So with that, let's move on to some of those leading trends. It's interesting to see that uh, some of the things that Henry was talking about are also backed into this presentation, and we hadn't actually seen each other's presentations, so <laughs> it's nice to see things uh, going back and forth. So better together. We really are better together. Where it's a consortium-like craft, where five different companies come together, all with unique different talents, to be the power of one, or it's something simple as, if you walk through the streets of Shoreditch, for example, in London, you'll see coffee shops and jean shops together. You'll see Negroni and hair salons together. Coming together is really is something much more of the future. You're gonna see a lot more of, of consortiums and people working together. Um, a higher cause. I think this is a little bit of spin-off from COVID. No one likes to make reference to that anymore. But the reality is that restaurants are now looking to a higher cause. It's not just about making money. It's not just about serving great food and beverage. It really is about um, that idea of giving something back. Whether it's something simple as cleaning the beach, donating some food to charity, the idea is that we need to be giving back to the community. Have you seen, have you been? The great hotels do this really well. There is a few that really do. And they take that one restaurant and they make it a billboard. It's an advert. It's, it's basically promoting the hotel, not the restaurant. Now, that restaurant still needs to make money, but the idea is that that restaurant is a billboard to promote the rooms in the hotel, not necessarily the restaurant itself. Storytelling. Storytelling goes without saying, but we're seeing this more and more, whether it's design or whether it's in operations. 
a great concept, a great design has to start with a story now, and we're seeing most designs and concepts now layering in, layering in stories. I think that's a really important thing. Technology. We wouldn't have a, a Beyond or a Trends presentation without technology. Um, but to be honest with you, what worries me about technology and something that we really need to look at is make sure that technology doesn't lose the human touch. We are in the hospitality industry, which means we're hospital to people. We want to make sure that the human touch doesn't get lost in, in, in um, technology. And you can see there some of the technology, AI everywhere. A AI is probably the ribbit of everything. You could even get your AI to write a, a menu these days, which is sad but true. Um, what AI can't do is the human touch. And I think as designers, we're being challenged more and more to ensure that the technology is present, new ideas, innovation, of course, but also to hide it so that we keep that environment feeling like it's a human environment and we're not completely swamped by technology. So going on now straight into some food and beverage. Um, these are direct food and beverage trends. Incidentally, um, these, this, this stuff has come together with asking you guys. We made a lot of phone calls. We sent out a lot of emails to get this information back. So you've got the Craft Consortium. You've got five, five people there who put into this. But we also reached out to you guys. You guys have given a, a lot of this information. So it's interesting to see that um, these trends actually came from multiple people, and they were saying the same type of thing. So the one of the first ones that we talked about was, was basically smaller menus. That in the old days, the hotel mentality was, I've got guests from India, I've got guests from South America, I need to have everything on the menu. Let's put some ceviche on the menu, let's put some curry on the menu, I need to cover that. Hotels are now wising up to that, and they're knowing that I do something and I do really well. So a smaller, tighter menu, and a lot of hotel restaurants now are really getting that down, down pat. There are a few that still kind of need to catch up, but I'm seeing across the board, and people are telling us that smaller menus is certainly a big trend. And do you think that's because historically independence really outperformed the hotel yeah. run venues? And, and the reason for that is because they are more focused, they've got a clear concept, and they're not trying to 100%. do all things for all people. Yeah. I mean, so honestly, hotelers sometimes, um, we're slow learners. We go to those independents and we see that they have menus with 12 dishes on the menu. And then we go back to our restaurant and we've got 52 dishes on the menu. And we see the quality of the food, the quality of the service they're offering. And slowly hotels are, are moving in that direction. The next thing um, is around, which one was this one? Oh, um, meat is the garnish. So uh, I think we all talk about veganism, we talk about vegetarian. I really didn't want to put that up there because I, I kind of see it everywhere. But I don't think meat is going away. Meat is going to be here, but we really think that meat now is something around a side dish or a garnish, smaller portions of quality product. Um, but I don't think it'll ever disappear completely. I think that is something that goes without saying. The next one, sustainability, um, all these type of things. Um, uh, I kind of feel like I didn't want to even put this one in the slide because everyone kept telling me, oh, it's all, it's all about sustainability, zero waste. To me, that's stable stakes. But you all said to me, no, it's very important, um, and it's something that will not go away. So the idea of being conscious about our food, carbon footprint, the miles, and all those type of things are, is very important. And, and to me, it's table stakes, but you're telling me still that it's a trend and something that, um, that, that we need to talk about. Finally, um, in the food area, we talked a little bit more about what is the cuisine. If we talked about... I think a year ago, we were up here talking about Nikkei. Before that, we were talking about Greek, you know, the Greek diet. What's happening in the market now? And what you told me, and I surprised a few of you told me, this Korean. Korean is an interesting cuisine. We had to dig around a little bit to find out why. And then one of the things that we looked at was that people want to be healthy. Go back to the trend before. People want to be healthy. And Korean food... Yes, it's spicy, but it also is healthy. It's full of probiotics, whether it's kimchi or other fermented foods. And we believe that people are seeing Korean as a health food as much as they are seeing as, as a dining trend. The other thing with Korean is that it's very interactive. Uh, if you get the right concept, you've got cooking at the table, you've got a lot of things going on with Korean, which makes it really, really interesting. Going on to some beverage ideas, some, bever some beverage trends. There's a few here which um, I think... Uh, have been around for a while, but perhaps uh, are becoming more and more, more, and more prominent. Uh, one of the ones that I kind of want to talk a little bit more about is batching. 
Uh, batching has changed from the idea of I'm going to save some money, I'm going to make all my cocktails beforehand, and I'm going to put them in a, in a jar, and then I'm going to tip them into a glass. Batching has become a science now, where actually a cocktail, which is made almost under laboratory conditions, with measuring jugs and test tubes, and that cocktail is made in a bulk form, but it, it's really made really well. And then the mixologist is finishing and shaking it, um, and then serving it up and garnishing it. So batching has gone from a labour-saving device to actually getting a more precise and a more focused cocktail. Another one, basically, um, is New Is Old. I think that's been around for a while, but we just had Negroni week, and I was in a few bars this week, and everyone was cooking up some great, great Negronis. And Negroni doesn't just have to be that classic, it can be a spin on that, and that's really what it, old, and new, old is New is about. Um, dry mixology. There's a couple of bars in London now, and these bars are outselling uh, the alcohol bars. These are dry bars in London that are doing so well. Dry mixology, I think, is I can't, it's a new mix. It's a new, it's a new mocktail. The word mocktail reminds me of a, an umbrella and a fruit juice and a glass. Um, dry mixology is a scientific approach to making great beverages that have no alcohol. So you're talking about smoking, fermenting, and making great cocktails around, um, around using ingredients that don't contain alcohol. And this is not about, because we're in this part of the world, this is happening across the world, New York, London, certainly here, and definitely in places like Saudi Arabia. I missed the top one. Top one is lo local fermentation. Now, that's a tricky one here because obviously we can't ferment uh, here, but a lot of bars now are actually fermenting their own spirits or um, brewing their own spirits only for that area. This is not about craft brewing. This is even smaller than that. This is micro, just making something for that particular bar or that particular menu. Um, here, you see a slightly spin-off of that. It's more infusing, taking alcohol and infusing it um, with, with different flavors. But in other parts of the world, this idea of microbrewing, super microbrewing, is a huge trend. Okay, I'm going to pass that to Sarah. Okay, so as you know, for those that you know me, know that design is something that um, Alex is particularly passionate about. However, the first topic is on kitchens. So do you want oh, to... Oh, that's me again. You, and by the way, you've only left me eight minutes. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, go on. I'll go fast on this one. Um, <laughs> so kitchens. Kitchens are becoming smaller, tighter. Technology is taking over. No longer do we need big, long cooking lines. The idea now is kitchen equipment can be multi-purposes and multi be used. So kitchens are becoming much smaller. They are still going to be out front. They, people still want to see them, they want to see the action, but they'll be behind glass windows. There you go, quick. Very good, right. So what we're seeing in terms of trends in hotels specifically is smaller, more compact spaces. Now, I know you're all going to say to me, but how about breakfast? And that's an ongoing conversation. But actually, what we've been doing is taking some lessons learned from the airport industry, where we have a full uh, back of house, one central cooking function, but we're now presenting to the client smaller, more boutique style, maybe, sing le maybe not single focus, but certainly smaller focus restaurants from the front. We're using design techniques so we can have, um, there's unbelievable amount of uh, bifolding doors, we've got swivel, partitions, lots of different things to allow us to open that space up and operate as one space for breakfast, but there's essentially being able to focus down a little bit and become um, smaller, more intense units for the customer choice at the end of the day. So that gives them more choice in the evening. So we've got a breakfast covered and then it gives us more choice in the evening. Indeed. Yeah. Okay, so interactive Uber experiences, it is just um, abundant right now. Um, and we're seeing more and more of this. Even this week, I um, have just, found, just been told about Mamma Mia experience in London, which apparently has come down with rave re reviews. So we are now seeing the rise of a lot more single focus restaurants. Um, in this case, it was very much led by theatricals um, and the West End experience coming to the food. Um, but what we're also hearing is that this time round, the food is exquisite and beautiful, beautiful culinary experience, as well as the single-focused yeah. restaurant. Um, I'm going to say theming's back. You say theming's never going to be back, back, and you die a thousand deaths. But, you know, there's lots of restaurants where we have uh, a single-focused that's, that's focused on something that's more than just the food and beverage. 
So that's something that we're yeah. seeing a lot of. In fact, um, we've just... You've got yeah. one. Yeah, we're just working on something which is a pottery school. So we're doing a pottery school and putting a restaurant into it, and it's in that order. We're doing a pottery school first and then backing a restaurant into the pottery school. And incidentally, those on the culinary tour, I think we're off to, to uh, Central, which is the Solution Leisure. Um, I think, Duncan, you're speaking um, with the team there uh, later on. Um, and again, that's very much focused on bowling, interaction, um, and, and having a great food experience at the same time. So we're seeing a lot of that. Um, dressing down. So um, I've looked across the room now, and I think I see one tie. Um, we're changing. We're certainly presenting ourselves in a different way. Christian and I both got trainers on. And as customers, we, are, we, are, we should be reflecting that trend in our restaurants. And there's a few reasons to that. First of all, obviously, we're providing to our clients' needs, and that's what we want, and people are now dressing down. Um, we're seeing it in the fashion industry as well. Um, the second reason for that is because of the experiential piece that we've just mentioned. We are looking at very much shorter return on investment periods. Maybe when I first started, we were looking to about eight years to return on investment. Now I'm getting three, three. years, and, and, and that's quite long. So when we do that, we need to design differently. And we design differently by repurposing materials, which brings us back to the sustainability. No longer do we have to be super accurate with the detailing to make sure as long as it works and it looks good, because why? It brings down our costs of refurbishment it, or, or build costs as well. Now, we're, what that brings me on to a slightly different uh, a trend that is part of this is that we are designing a lot to budget. This massive difference. I mean, 10 years ago, no one told the designer a budget. It just would never, ever happened. Now, and I can see some of my clients in the room, literally, that's where we start. I won't make money out of my restaurant if you can't build this space yeah. for this amount of money. And that's a definite a twist in 10 years' time. I'd also like to add that I think when you design to a budget, you force creativity. You force the idea of things being different. I, I, I love the idea of, of, of working under a budget because it puts you under this, this restraint of creativity. Yeah, we've, we've just done a project together um, on the Palm, and budget was absolutely the um, forefront of, our, of yeah. our work. But the things that we were able to achieve under that budget actually made that project a really fun project. And I'm, I'm Using really some of these philosophies. Some yeah. of yeah. these yeah. philosophies, yeah. indeed. Yeah. Let's move on. We're struggling. Right, white space. Biggest uh, change that we've seen um, is a problem, really. We design, res we design full hotels, and we're doing that normally around about five years before the hotel opens. Now, Christian and Duncan and his team can do everything they like and research, but they have no magic wand. They're not going to know what's cool in five years' time. So what we're now doing as part of our hotel design is we're white-boxing the food and beverage. Now, we're still designing the MEP. We're still uh, considering uh, fire and life safety. We're still looking at operations, toilets, and everything that you would expect. But the actual design layering is held off to 18 months before we plan to open. That gives us enough time to do the research. We already have a lot of knowledge within our team anyway. We're, re we're re researching at that point, And then we go hell for leather, making sure that when we open that restaurant, the food and beverage is still relevant. So that's a big change. We're and if you go back to what we said earlier on about shelf life of a restaurant is three to four years, if we've got any 18 months out, we send a lot much chance of that restaurant being, being a little bit longer than five years ago. Indeed. Right, um, outdoors in. So um, it says outdoors in, but we, I now think that it's the other way round. So just tell you a little bit about what this is. Um, there's a lot, of, particularly in refurbishment, we're talking a lot about dressing. And one of the biggest trends we see, we talked, you talked about it brilliantly with the IKEA product, there's a lot of conversation about air quality, about uh, a more healthy restaurant. And one of the things we're seeing a lot of, it's very, very cheap to do, is bring a lot of botanicals into the restaurant environment. Cheap to do, don't need construction costs, can repurpose a restaurant very, very quickly. The other side of this as well, on this side of the conversation, is that obviously for garden furniture and outdoor furniture tends to be um, very strongly led by local materials, which gives us that real sense of place and the environment that we're in. But... Kind of merges the outdoor <laughs> in, you know, like there's no longer an interior design or, or landscaping. The whole thing is just one thing. Just get into that. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm looking at the clock. 
<laughs> now, the reason why I said I don't think it's the outdoor in, I think it's the indoor out, is because what we are doing, and we actually currently are doing, is taking indoor nuances out to our terraces. In fact, I think Andrew's working on a project right now where we're actually moving the design lines slightly into the property so that we can create more outdoor spaces. But of course, the UAE is a very, very warm place. So we're seeing the rise of outdoor cooling, underfloor cooling, really clever, innovative um, ways. I mean, I was going to say sustainable, but they're not. So, I mean, warming outside is never going to be sustainable. So, but certainly try and improve the sustainability uh, out, outside. Um, we, I mean, we've got scatter rugs outside yeah. where we are trying to merge the transition between the inside and outside and the outside inside, because that's where people want to be. They want to be outside. So with that, we're nine, oh. we're nine seconds over. Oh. <laughs> <laughs>